right. All right. So again, welcome everybody. Our June meeting. This is our second uh, live video meeting. So I hope everybody enjoys this one. Uh, remember, we do have last meeting's uh, video on YouTube, and you can get that through equalitygardenclub.com as well. Just go to the meetings tab, and you can find more information there and find the video in there. So today's meeting is for Native and Invasive Vines of Southeast Florida by Adam Pitcher. And it will also be on Facebook Live. So if you find that you have uh, lost this video or, or you can't get back in for some reason, uh, you can check the uh, Facebook account for a tropical plant fair. Just search a tropical plant fair in the uh, search bar and you'll find us. So let's see, interesting. Our agenda today is pretty simple. So remarks and instructions by me. I'm Justin Lowe, uh, the club marketing person. And we're gonna open the meeting with Van, our president. Uh, there will be some instructions and some comments and then introduction for Adam by Carl Shearer, our vice club vice president, one of them, or it's the one, I, I always get confused. And then we will move on to the presentation by Adam Pitcher. We're looking at a, about a 45 minute or so presentation and there will be questions. You can post your questions as we go along and there will be some opportunity at the end as well to uh, hear some answers. And then there will be comments and announcements by Carl again, our, our club vice president, and then the meeting will be closed by Van. So we're hoping to wrap things up by eight, but uh, don't feel constrained there. If uh, Adam's having a great time and everybody's asking some amazing questions, we might continue on. And so tips and remarks. So audi all audience members will remain muted and without video. I will be turning video off uh, for anyone who joins with video because it's, it's just gonna be distracting for most people. Um, you can, if you're on the Zoom meeting, you can post your comments um, in the chat. There's a chat box. It should be on your screen somewhere. Everyone has a different version of Zoom, so I apologize, I can't explain it. But normally there's a little button that says chat. You click there and we will have Carl in there uh, collecting questions, sending them to me, and then I will be presenting those to Adam near the end of his meeting or throughout his meeting, however he would like. And um, if you do get to disconnected, please use the uh, link from the updated email that we just sent out about 15 minutes ago. Uh, people were having problems with our previous email, so please use the updated one to come back in. And for Facebook Live, um, anyone watching there, you're about 30 seconds behind everybody else, but feel free to post all of your questions in the comments. Uh, make sure to do that on the a Tropical Plant Fair page. If you do it anywhere else, we probably won't see those questions. So please make sure to go to the original post and make sure to put your comments in there. And then, um, Again, once you're finished, please, or once you've joined into the meeting from Facebook, please share it so everybody else can see it. Um, on Facebook, your comments will be reviewed by Mario, and Mario will add them again to my list, and from there, I'll be able to ask them near the end of the meeting uh, to Adam. So uh, for now, I'll be stuck behind the scenes. Uh, you won't hear from me until the end, mostly, and we will move on to uh, Van. Good evening. I'm Van Gosser. I'm the president of the group. I haven't met you guys. I haven't seen you guys in live in, since February, and I really do miss our interactions. But this is the best we can do for the time being. I hope it's informative that you enjoy it. And, um, you know, excuse me, Justin has already gone through the agenda. There's no big problem there, and so I don't have to do that. And I want to keep this meeting uh, concentrated on our speaker. That's why you're here. You're not here to see me. Oh, well, excuse me. So uh, let me just give you a quick heads up on something which is going on. Very important to our membership. And I, this is directed to the members and uh, as well as to our guests, but primarily to our members. And that's that uh, we have been approached by the city of uh, Oakland Park to participate in their, uh, in, in their Million Orchid project. This project is, a, uh, is organized by the Fairchild uh, Gardens, and it's the plan of it, the mission of it, is, is to introduce indigenous orchids back into uh, Broward County. It's a very interesting project. The board has reviewed it, and we're very much interested in participating. 
However, we didn't have all the information that we really felt comfortable with just yet. We really wanted to go and make sure that the uh, members were totally in tune with what's going on, and we really want to have some feedback about it. So uh, in having done that, we arranged to have the president of the Fort Lauderdale Orchid Society to uh, come and talk with us next month in the July meeting. That'll be the third week of July. And he is going to be giving details about the whole project. And this is an opportunity for people who love orchids or are interested in the environment or who are interested in uh, re recreating the environment that has been so much destroyed. And um, we want to make sure that uh, you, you attend this. I encourage everybody to go and do it. Um, I don't want to get too much on this. this is, you're going to be in the, it's going to be in the newsletter, and you'll also be hearing more about it as this comes up. The point I really want to make is, though, I'd like to encourage our members to, uh, to join this meeting. And the reason being is we would like to have the feedback from the membership about what they would like to do and if they would be interested in participating in this project. So it's, we really need feedback. And since we can't meet in person, this is the only way we can do it. And what we'll do is after that meeting in July, we will be sending out a poll and asking our members to comment on, uh, on any suggestions that we may be making at that time. But that will be clarified later. Um, I said that we want to keep this brief. I'm going to introduce Carl and have him take over and introduce our speaker, which is what we really came here for. I hope everybody's healthy and happy. And I truly, truly hope to see you soon. And with that, I'll turn over to Carl. Great. Members uh, and guests, welcome. Tonight we have Adam Pitcher who will be speaking about native and invasive vines of Southeast Florida. Adam is a program assistant to the urban horticulture, a part of the University of Florida IFAS Broward County Extension Services. He currently has a degree in environmental science from Broward College and was recently admitted to the University of Florida's Doctor of Plant Medicine program. We're very fortunate in that he will be leaving uh, soon, so we were, we were lucky that we were able to have him uh, this month for the presentation. Uh, he also helped create the Broward College Herborum, uh, which is and has had a significant experience with working with and collecting plants and insects from uh, natural areas of South Florida. With that, let me introduce to you Adam Pitcher. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining me. Um, like I said, my name is Adam, and uh, obviously we don't have time to go over every single vine that occurs here. So instead, the two main things I'm going to be teaching you are how to recognize the different types of vines you commonly find, as well as the types of things to look for if you're trying to identify a vine and make some recommendations of the different vines that you either should or should not be growing at home. And I, you know, always like to answer as many questions as possible. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And my email address is right up here, a.pitcher at ufl.edu. And you're certainly welcome to use that if you ever have any questions about plants or insects or anything like that. So with that, I'm going to get started. And first thing, what makes a plant a vine? All it really means is that the plant doesn't support its own weight. Usually that means it's climbing on another plant, but most vines will use whatever they can find or hold on to. It just depends on what's around and how that vine attaches itself. Some vines have tendrils, some just wrap around other things. Uh, sometimes vines can use spines or thorns to help attach themselves. With one extremely notable exception, which I will talk about later, virtually all vines are flowering plants. So most vines are going to be valuable to pollinators, some certainly more than others. Whenever you hear or read about vines, the term liana is likely to come up. Uh, all that means is that it's a large climbing woody vine. 
lianas aren't necessarily related to each other. It's just a term for how certain vines grow. We don't have too many of those in South Florida, but there are a few around. Vines are awesome, and I sincerely hope you'll agree with me by the end of this presentation, if you don't already. One of the coolest things about vines is how quickly they're able to grow. And one of the main reasons vines are able to grow so quickly is because they save a tremendous amount of energy by using other surfaces as support. They don't need to develop thick branches or a robust trunk or anything like that uh, to support the weight of all of their leaves and stems. So even their vascular systems are often much more efficient because they don't have to worry about being sturdy or developing um, anything beyond the, whatever the bare minimum is. Whatever substrate they're growing on is usually supporting all of their weight for them. And depending on the habitat, vines can contribute more than a third of the total forest leaf area. So it's quite common for vines to be one of the primary factors in any of the ecological processes that are going on. This picture exemplifies one of the main reasons people don't like certain vines, or at least the idea of certain vines. There's no getting around the fact that vines are usually bad for the plants they grow on, and it's really easy to feel bad for those plants, especially if it's something in your yard. But if it's in a natural area and we're talking about native plants, then the thing to keep in mind is that those plants should have co-evolved with each other and that they're both part of whatever the natural cycle of that area is. Vines can and will kill some of the plants that they're growing on. But there are all kinds of plants and animals that uh, live primarily in forest gaps. Besides all the animals that use dead trees for food and shelter, besides all the animals that use the vines themselves. This is a picture of kudzu, probably one of the most stereotypical and well-known vines in the United States. Uh, we don't really have that this far south. Uh, it occurs a little bit more in northern Florida, thankfully. Um, well, thankfully it doesn't occur here, I mean. <laughs> um, but we do have a few invasives that can do pretty much the same thing in this area. Natives, again, just in South Florida, don't really do this, uh, except under very specific circumstances. They can smother smaller areas, but a large area like this, you'll pretty much never see a native vine growing that way in this area. So how to start identifying vines. Uh, the main way I'm going to be presenting these plants to you is by what family they're in. And the main traits I'm gonna be going over won't necessarily be able to tell you what species it is automatically, but it will or it should help give you an idea of what the vine is related to. So you can have some idea of what you're looking at. Not all members of the plant families I'm covering are vines, but if you do see that it is a vine, then these are the traits that you should be looking for. One of the best identifiers of vines is always the tendrils. And that's always one of the first things I try to look at if I can tell that something is a vine. Uh, you wanna pay attention to, first of all, does it have any tendrils? And if it does, how many are they? Or how, how many are there? And where are they? How are they coming out of the plant? After that, uh, leaf arrangement and morphology are always super important if you're trying to identify any plants, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The first vines I'm going to cover are the ones that don't have tendrils. All of the vines in this presentation are either native or invasive. I'm not really going to talk about ornamental vines so much, except the native ones that you could grow at home. And since I know a lot of people are going to be wondering where they can actually go to get these, uh, floridanativenurseries.org is an excellent resource if you're trying to find native plants of any kind. And if you want to find these plants in the wild, inaturalist.org is an excellent website. I would highly recommend uh, checking it out anyway, but if you want to see some of these plants in the wild, that's a great place to go and it'll tell you where they are and how many of them are in the general area. And you can see pictures of them so you can make sure that's actually a right plant. 
So the first family I'm going to talk about are morning glories or the morning glory family. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time with them than most of the other families because this is one of the largest plant families in Florida. There are about 70 different species, most of which can be found in Southeast Florida. And thankfully for as weedy as they can be, we really don't have any bad invasives as far as morning glories are concerned. Certainly there are non-natives. About a third of the different species that you can find here are, are non-native, but none of them are a really bad invasive in this area. They're one of the easier types of vines to identify because of how incredibly simple they are. They don't have tendrils and the leaves are always alternate and simple. Alternate just means only one leaf comes out of the stem at a time and simple just means it's a single leaf blade that isn't divided. There is one other common family here that looks a bit like that and I'll get into that a bit later. Uh, this is the same family that sweet potatoes are in, which is not meant to imply that anything else in this family is in any way edible. Many of them are, in fact, quite poisonous. Uh, when you do see a lot of them, especially in urban areas, they'll look the way this one does, where it's starting to smother things. Not, not as bad as kudzu, but especially along things like fences or um, newly planted Plants can sometimes get them sprouting up around them and they'll take over pretty quickly. Um, they all have some wildlife value, uh, mostly because of the flowers. But as far as something you'd want in your yard, most of the plants in this family are not things you're gonna wanna have to deal with long-term. These are two of the more common species that you'll normally find and they are occasionally cultivated. You can hardly find a beach in uh, South Florida that doesn't have railroad vines somewhere. Uh, you know, it's a great plant for being in dunes as far as something in your landscape. Most people don't have the right type of landscape for a plant like that. It would be an excellent plant to, to try and grow on a green roof. So if you had a type of roof or someone was trying to make a type of roof where you grew plants on it, railroad vine would absolutely be a great plant to use for that. Um, moonflowers are absolutely gorgeous. It's a huge white flower that only blooms at night. And it's great for attracting large moths. Um, certainly not something people think of when they think of pollinators all the time, but they are very important pollinators. And you know, it, it's a great plant for that purpose, but like a lot of the other plants in the family, it can be very weedy. If I was going to recommend plants in this family, these are two of the main ones that I wish people would grow more often. Uh, especially if you don't wanna deal with something that's gonna get huge and be difficult to manage. The first one, Scarlet Creeper, it's still a little bit rambunctious. Um, it, it is a morning glory and it will be a little bit weedy, but it's much easier to control than a lot of the other species. One of the main reasons that I bring it up is that it has bright red flowers that are also long and tubular. And that means it's going to be highly attractive to hummingbirds. So if you want to attract hummingbirds to your yard, this is one of the best native plants that you can get. Uh, the other plant, uh, Pineland jacmania, this one's a lot easier to find in natural areas, especially like in big cypress. And uh, it doesn't get nearly as large, probably only like between five to 10 feet and probably closer to five feet most of the time. Their flowers are going to be much more attractive to bees and butterflies. But both of them are much more well-behaved than a lot of the other members. They don't get as big or grow as fast. And both of these are plants that you could easily just stick in a pot and give it a tomato cage or something like that, and it'll be perfectly fine. This is one of my absolute favorite plants, vine or not, uh, the sky blue cluster vine. Uh, this is an endangered species. Um, you can easily get si seeds online because it is heavily cultivated and why wouldn't it be? It's absolutely gorgeous. It is a prolific bloomer, but it really only blooms in winter, which is you know both good and bad in that it's not gonna bloom all year, but it will be blooming heavily when a lot of other things aren't. 
So any pollinators that are active at the time are going to be heavily attracted to it, especially bees. Um, the one that I have, which is the one in this picture, it started blooming uh, back in November and it just stopped blooming a couple months ago. So that's about half of the year. And, you know, it doesn't require much care uh, other than potentially cutting it back so it doesn't get completely out of control. And it does sprout up constantly in my yard, but it's not growing all over other plants. It's just, you know, occasionally I see it sprout up in the yard and, you know, you run over it with the lawnmower, there's no problem, it's gone. Um, here's another one I have on the side of my yard. And this is actually growing on a fence post that just has some mesh wrapped around it, which not the prettiest thing by itself, but you cannot see the fence post anymore. And, you know, it, it's super prolific blooming, all kinds of pollinators flocking to it. And this one is only in uh, full sun for about half the day. The other half of the day it's in full shade because it's right on the side of the house. Sorry. Uh, so this is the family that I mentioned before that is slightly like morning glories. Really the only thing that you would ever confuse for a morning glory, um, but it's definitely not. Air potato is probably uh, the plant most commonly mistaken for a morning glory. And it, this is basically the kudzu of, of South Florida. Um, I've seen it smother and kill other invasive species like Australian pines. So we could easily have a whole lecture just about how bad these are for the environment. I, for now, I'll just say it's one of the worst invasive species we have here, and you should absolutely never let it start growing in an area unless you never want to be rid of it again. Uh, the picture on the bottom right here, those are the, those are the uh, bulbs that form on the vine and which is why it's called air potato. And even one of those just the size of a pea that falls off can start a new plant. So you can see how it can be, get out of control extremely quickly. All of these came off of one vine that I found. Uh, we do actually have two native species of air potato in Florida, but they're much more Northern. You're not going to see them here. Uh, and you know, here you can see they do have a superficial resemblance to each other. And they also have a number of similar features. Uh, they both have alternate simple leaves and neither one has tendrils. The flower of air potato is just a little white thing that most people never see. I've never seen it in person yet. Um, so it, it's not something you'd ever confuse with a morning glory if it's blooming. But if the vines are bare otherwise, the main way that you can tell them apart is by looking at the veins. Um, you can see on the left, the primary veins of the morning glory, and I should be able to draw a little bit here. They start at the base of the leaf and then they spread out, then meet back at the tip. And that's a, a common thing for all monocots. Uh, air potatoes are a type of plant called a monocot. So they're related, more closely related to things like grasses, orchids, bromeliads, those sorts of things. And they all have parallel primary veins. Um, it looks a little di different because air potato leaves are significantly different than any of those other plants. But on the morning glory, you can see it really only has one primary vein and then all the other veins start splitting pretty quickly. Uh, and that's a, a reticulate type of venation. So that's pretty much one of the main ways that you would try and uh, tell the difference between a morning glory and an air potato, assuming it doesn't have anything else like the air potatoes or the flowers. And I'm sure anyone that's spent time in the natural areas in South Florida has seen this vine. I know it also occurs in up north quite a bit as well. The thing is, I can't tell you just from this picture whether it's a daughter, which is a type of morning glory, or if it's love vine, which is actually more closely related to bay trees. That's the same type of trees like uh, bay leaves that you use for cooking. Um, they are not closely related at all, but they look almost exactly the same. And the only way to tell the difference is if you can find the flowers or the fruit. 
This vine is one of our most common vines, and unlike virtually all other vines, it is truly parasitic. A lot of people will call vines parasites, which isn't entirely inaccurate because, you know, it's, it's using its host plant as a substrate and not really giving anything back, so it, it's kind of a parasitic relationship. But these plants do actually attack the plant they're growing on, and they will suck uh, water and nutrients out of it. A, they don't normally kill whatever plant they're growing on. Uh, and if they, the plant it's growing on dies, generally speaking, so will they, unless they're attached to something else. But they can significantly weaken them. Um, it, it's not something you see in urban areas all that often, unless it's right next to a natural area. But once it starts attaching itself to a plant, it's extremely difficult to get off without just cutting the parts of the plant that it's attached to off. So the next family I'm gonna talk about is the dogbane family or the milkweed family. Um, either one is accurate. This family isn't super well represented in South Florida. There's more of them up north, but it, it, it's still pretty common to find one or two of them around. Um, what sets this family apart is that it has opposite leaves, which you can see over here. That means two leaves come out at a time instead of just one. But one of the easiest ways to recognize them is the sap. And the thing about the plants in this family, really any family that has white sap, you should just assume that it's poisonous. But the plants in this family especially can be extremely poisonous. This is the same family as oleander, um, a, a lot of other really poisonous plants. And the sap especially is poisonous. If it gets in your eyes at all, even just a tiny bit, it can cause temporary blindness and even permanent eye damage. I know several people that have had to go to the hospital because they wiped the sweat from their brow and they happen to have just a drop of the sap on the back of their hand. It is extremely dangerous and not something uh, to play around with. And th this is true of all milkweeds, not just the vines in this family. And so if you have like a dog that's just gonna eat anything and it ate something in this, uh, ate, ate plants in this family, that could be a potential serious problem. Um, None of the true milkweeds, like plants in the genus Asclepius, that we have here are vines. But we do have white twine vine, which is an extremely important plant that I don't know why it's not more heavily cultivated, but anyone that's trying to attract monarchs to their yard really should consider getting a white twine vine. Because it's a vine, it's going to end up being significantly large than most of the other milkweeds. I won't say necessarily it will grow all that much faster, but it will provide an additional alternative host plant for the monarchs, queens, and soldiers. So it, it's definitely something that's really great to have. On the right is wild alamanda, which is not a true alamanda, but you know, what difference does it make? It's, it's has beautiful uh, yellow flowers. This is another plant. I don't really understand why it's not grown more often. It blooms most of the year. It requires very little care and it's not super huge or anything. It's only gonna get to be maybe 10 to 15 feet. Uh, you know, just constant year round yellow flowers, really attractive to all kinds of pollinators. Certainly something I would love to see used more. As far as ones you're likely to see in the wild easily, the mangrove rubber vine is probably the most common one. Uh, if you go anywhere that has mangroves or even just uh, brackish water, you're probably going to find mangrove rubber vines somewhere. I always enjoy seeing them, but it's really not something that I would recommend for the home garden. Uh, they're just a bit too too wild and scraggly. Um, I've done a lot of invasive removal in areas where this has been growing. And there have been times where it's been wrapped around whatever tree I'm trying to cut down so much that 
after I cut it down, it just starts swinging from the canopy because it's so heavily entwined in the canopies of all the plants around, um, which as an aside is something to be very mindful of if you're working with a tree that has a vine on it. You wanna make sure uh, what that vine is also attached to and um, you're going to want to cut away as much of the vine as possible before you try to do any work with the tree, even if you're just trying to trim a branch off or something like that. The philodendron family, um, I, this is one of those families people don't necessarily think of them as vines, uh, but most of the plants that are in this family in this area are going to be escaped house plants. We don't really have any native plants in this family that are vines. And all the ones that do escape, at least as far as the vines are concerned, tend to be highly invasive and difficult to control. I love the plants in this family, but here on the right, you can see this, this is pothos. And this is the exact same pothos that you have as a house plant. When you let it go out into the wild, once it starts climbing a tree and gets into full sunlight, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it turns into a complete monster that is extremely difficult to control. Uh, the one on the left is arrowhead vine, which is also extremely common. Um, the way you identify these is that the vines attach themselves by their roots that come out of the stem. And there are some other plants that will do that, but in this case, the roots are quite long, they can reach all the way around the trunk in some cases, and they're also going to be succulent. Uh, the plants in this family are never woody, so that's another way you can tell it's one of these. Most other vines that you find are going to become woody at some point, but these will never be woody. And one of the things you really need to watch out for, for these are that the sap often contains these things called raphides, which you can see here on the left, and they're basically microscopic crystals uh, that you know look and act kind of like sewing needles. If you get this sap on you and you happen to be sensitive to it, or you you know rub it into a wound, or God forbid you get it in your eye, it could cause a lot of damage, um, or at least a lot of pain and irritation. So if you do have to work with these plants, always use gloves and definitely make sure you're not getting it anywhere near your face or your mouth or anything like that. The climbing ferns, uh, Ligodium, these are pretty much all invasive as far as the ones you find here. There are, there is a native one, but again, it's a much more northern species. This is really the only uh, non-flowering vine that we have in this area. And unfortunately, it is a terrible, terrible invasive. You're probably not going to find it in urban areas, and I haven't found it in natural areas in Broward so much, but out in the Everglades, it is absolutely terrible. Um, here you can see a picture of it, and this is a fairly normal depiction of it. This isn't even that bad. I, I've seen pictures of it completely covering entire tree islands out in the Everglades. So it's basically the only thing you can see from the air. Um, and one of the worst parts of this vine is that it severely affects the fire regime in natural areas. Fire is absolutely a natural part of Florida's ecosystems. But during the dry season, these Ligodium mats can become extremely flammable, which can both artificially intensify fires as well as bring the flames much higher than what would naturally occur. Um, at all, a lot of Florida's natural areas are adapted to fire, but that isn't necessarily supposed to be burning up into the canopy. Ligodium allows that, and of course they aren't killed by the fire at all. They have underground rhizomes, so they sprout right back up after a fire and just take over things even more. So now we're gonna start getting into the vines that have tendrils. And again, I'm gonna reiterate the positioning of the tendrils is very important if you're trying to identify what type of vine it is. Uh, for the passion flowers, the tendrils emerge from the leaf axle, which is this area right here, where the, uh, the upper side of where the leaf meets the stem. And the only other vine around this area is 
that does that is coral vine, which is more of an ornamental and I, I almost never see it, but their flowers are completely different. So you shouldn't get them confused. Uh, we have five native species of passion vine in our area, plus another one further north. And there are a couple that aren't native, you can see occasionally. But generally speaking, if you find a vine in a natural area and the tendrils coming out of leaf axle like that, it's almost certainly going to be a passion flower of some kind. Uh, this is probably the one most people are familiar with and is seen most often. I, you can hardly find a natural area that doesn't have at least some corky stem in it. And this is the host plant for the Gulf, frit uh, Gulf fritillary, the Julia, and the zebra longwing, but it's also the host plant for the variegated fritillary, which no one ever mentions, but it is in this area. Uh, I mentioned iNaturalist earlier, and you can go on there and people have seen it in South Florida, so it's around, but um, regardless, these plants are, you know, one of the mainstays of any butterfly garden. Uh, the fruit is edible, but it's not very good for the corky stem. The other ones generally have much better fruit. The, the fruit on the corky stem is really mostly good for staining things purple. At some point, I'd love to try and get a whole bunch of them and like dye a shirt or something like that, just to see how well it would work. But anyone who's ever squished one of the fruit can see quite clearly how much it stains anything it touches. The purple passion flower is one of the more common ones that you see. Um, if I was gonna try and grow a passion flower for butterflies and I had the space, that's certainly the one that I would grow. Uh, every time I've tried to grow the corky stem, the caterpillars just end up killing it. And I don't know if that's just you know my particular area. I know other people haven't had that experience, but the corky stem isn't that large a plant, so it can only support so much, whereas the purple passion flower is huge and it grows really fast. Uh, I know a lot of people that have tried to grow it and they've end up regretting it. So please be aware of how large it gets. I mean, it, it, I, I've seen them more than 50 feet. So, you know, if you have it long enough, it will take up any area that you can give it. So just be aware of that. The Pineland passion flower is one of our lesser seen ones, but it is in cultivation. So you, so you can get it. It's an endangered species. So you're not likely to see it in the wild all that much unless you go to specific areas. It's also not as attractive to butterflies as the other two, but my understanding is that it will serve as the host plant. So if you were going to try and get one, uh, it would probably be worth it to grow a corky stem with it to help attract the butterflies. Uh, but it's not as big or aggressive as the purple passion flower. So if you don't have enough room for that, I, I think the Pineland passion flower is probably a happy medium between the two. The squash family, uh, probably a lot more common to see these as uh, something you're growing for food, uh, but there are quite a few different species in Florida. Like I said, it's always important to pay attention to where the tendril emerges from and how. In this case, uh, the plants in the squash family have their tendrils emerging from the vine at a 90 degree angle to the leaf. So you can see the leaf is over here and then the tendril is over here and it makes this L shape coming out of the stem. It is really difficult to get a good picture of that, um, but it's pretty easy to see if you can find a vine and look at it. You, you can see quite clearly, okay, it, it's coming out at a right angle. Um, it, it's not a difficult trait to distinguish. Um, another way to identify the plants in this family is from the leaves. They're often quite fragrant and not necessarily in a good way. Some of them can smell quite bad. Um, it, it, nothing else really has a smell quite like it. The flowers are also pretty distinctive as well. Um, as far as the ones you're gonna see in the wild here, these are the two main ones. The creeping cucumber and balsam pear. Creeping cucumber is another plant I really wish people would grow more often. It's edible when it's green and it, the fruit is really small. They're only like half an inch, maybe up to an inch in some situations, but it tastes just like a cucumber. There's very little difference. So to me, that seems like something that would 
really go great in a salad. And the fact that it's a native plant that you can eat and grow very easily, to me, that's just really cool. When the fruit is ripe, it actually turns black and it becomes poisonous at that point. So you eat it when it's not ripe. For the balsam pear, I, if you look online, you can find all kinds of things that talk about the health benefits of balsam pear or bitter melon. I've also seen it called balsam apple. Um, I am not a doctor, not yet anyway, so I am not going to speak to any medical benefits it may or may not have. What I can say is that uh, parts of it can be poisonous if it is not prepared correctly, and it is also a pretty bad invasive species. If you start letting it grow, you're going to have a heck of a time getting rid of it. And it also smells really bad, so the more you work with it, the more you're going to get that smell on you. Um, everyone that I know that's tried to grow this for whatever reason has ended up regretting it. So, fair warning. Uh, the Smilax are definitely going to be something that you see a lot more of. And these have paired tendrils. And so what that means is every time that there's a new leaf, two tendrils are going to come out, one on either side of the leaf. And uh, whenever you're trying to look for tendrils on a vine, it's usually best to look at the new growth because tendrils can fall off over time, so can the leaves. But the new growth is going to be where they're usually most apparent, especially in Smilax. A lot of times the uh, tendrils will be full size before the leaf has you know, barely even started to emerge. So it, it's pretty obvious looking at it that way. Um, these are also called cat briar. And, uh, you, you know, I can't think of any natural area I've been to that didn't have a lot of these. Uh, there are many different native plants and they can be a bit difficult to tell from each other. Thankfully, we don't have any non-native ones here. So if you see a Smilax, you know it's a native one, almost certainly. Um, this is one of the main reasons people don't grow it. Uh, I'd say at least 90% of the damage from all of my field clothes is from walking into Smilax. Uh, this is a large, strong vine and these thorns do not give very easily and they are more than sharp enough to pierce your clothes as well as your skin. And they are fairly ubiquitous. So if you're walking through any heavily wooded area, you're probably gonna run into them. And you know, it, it's basically like a naturally occurring barbed wire. Uh, the new shoots of Smilax are edible and are supposed to taste like asparagus. The roots, um, form a large tuber that you can cook and it will also be edible. And a type of Smilax was used in making sarsaparilla, if anybody's familiar with that, uh, as well as some forms of root beer. Uh, these are all good plants for wildlife. Definitely something that's supposed to be in natural areas. But, you know, if you wanted to grow one just for the new shoots, uh, Certainly that's something you can do, but I personally do not like working in or around this plant. And uh, it, I would be hesitant to recommend it to anyone for any reason, <laughs> other than to be careful around it. The grape family is probably one of the mo most common types of vines you'll find in wild areas, not just in Florida, but in the United States. Um, most of the time in South Florida, if you find a big woody vine, which would be a liana, it's almost certainly going to be a great vine of some kind. And th this is another super fam easy family to identify if you know how. In this case, the tendrils come out of the stem on the opposite side of the leaf. Uh, nothing else around here really looks like that. So if you can find that character, you know you're looking at a grapevine. Uh, not all the leaves are going to have a tendril on the other side. Uh, as you can see here, this one doesn't have a tendril, but every time you see a tendril, there's a leaf on the other side. If you've never had the pleasure of eating wild muscadines, I would highly recommend it. Uh, they are really just 
grapes. And I've seen them sold in stores occasionally, and you can definitely make wine and jellies of, out of them and all of that. Uh, they taste, you know, just like a grape, and this is absolutely a native plant. Uh, they do have separate male and female plants, though. So if you wanted to get one to grow yourself, that's something to be aware of. Um, you would have to have some guarantee by whoever's selling it that it's a female plant. Because if it's male, it might look nice, but it's never going to give you any fruit. The Virginia creeper is another plant in this family. Probably one of the most commonly seen vines, again, in the whole country. Its range is enormous. It, it's from, you know, all the way in South Florida, as far west as uh, well into Texas, at least, and as far north as Canada. So it has an absolutely enormous range. And since it tends to grow in areas that actually get a winter, it's one of the few plants that will give us the fall colors in South Florida. So it's good for that. The fruit on this are not edible to people. They are, in fact, poisonous but birds love them. Um, you can see the tendrils on this one up here. They've been modified to be basically adhesive discs. So it can grow on anything basically. And those discs do not detach easily. Uh, I have some on a fence where I, uh, I let Virginia creeper grow about 10 years ago and the discs are still on there. And it, you know, it, they're, probably not going to go away as long as the fence is there. So something to be mindful of if you let it grow on anything you have. Uh, one of the other things about Virginia creeper is some people react to it the same way that they react to poison ivy. So that's definitely something to be mindful of if you haven't come in close contact with it yet. And of course, I can't talk about Virginia creeper at all without also mentioning poison ivy because they're constantly confused with each other. Uh, poison ivy is not a grape. It's actually in the same family as mangoes, cashews, and Brazilian pepper. Um, it's the only vine in that family that we have here. Poison oak is a much more northern species, but it is closely related. Uh, everyone's probably heard the saying, leaves of three, let it be. And first of all, it should be leaflets three, because this whole structure here, that's one leaf. Uh, the other thing uh, about trying to tell them apart is, you know, if you can see the leaves and tell them apart that way, that's great. But both of them have a tendency to lose all their leaves in the winter. So in that case, how do you tell them apart? So uh, as I already said, the Grapevines have tendrils that come out opposite of the leaves, but of course, if it doesn't have leaves, that isn't necessarily the best thing to look at. Poison ivy does not have tendrils at all. So if you can see that the vine has tendrils, you know it's not poison ivy. The way poison ivy attaches itself is actually through adventitious roots, which are these things on the right. And it will make dozens, if not hundreds, of tiny roots all in the same area. Um, and it can do that many times over all across the stem. And it'll just keep making more as it gets older. Virginia creeper can also attach by adventitious roots as well as the adhesive discs, but their roots aren't going to be nearly as numerous and they're also going to be significantly larger. So probably not something that's gonna be easily confused. Um, if you look here, you can see, uh, you know, this has five leaflets, the uh, poison ivy on the right has three, but also if, if you get used to seeing them and working around them, they can be pretty easy to tell apart. Uh, when they're just seedlings, that's when it becomes really difficult. And Virginia creeper will often have tendrils even as a seedling, but sometimes it won't. So it, it's definitely something to be mindful of. Um, and you know, as always, if you're not sure what a plant is, you probably shouldn't be touching it regardless. And that covers all the main groups of vines that normally have tendrils. Uh, this is the last major group that I'm going to cover. And the, it, this is easily one of the most diverse families, uh, regardless of whether or not it's a vine. Not everything in this family is a vine, of course. Many of them are trees or ground covers or all kinds of other plants. 
Uh, some of them have tendrils, some of them don't, so that's not a reliable way to ID them. What they do almost always have are alternate compound leaves. And most of the time, if you find any plant with alternate compound leaves, it's probably in the pea family. Again, alternate just means it makes one leaf at a time. Compound means that the leaf is split into multiple smaller leaflets. And I'll give a good example of that later. Uh, this is hairy cow pea, just fairly common plant, easy to identify because the fruit has these hairs on them. And this is a fairly standard looking pea flower, which is also another way to identify plants in the family. One of the main things to look for for any pea plant are the fruits, which are legumes. And legumes are usually long capsules with all the seeds in a single row. And they are one of the more unique traits of the pea family. So a lot of different things to keep in mind, but if you can learn to recognize those things, it's pretty easy to recognize that something is in the pea family. Um, this is another family I could easily do a whole presentation on, so I'm gonna just try and stick with a few of my favorites. I absolutely love Nickerbean, and this picture does not do this beast of a plant justice. This is a solid wall at least 50 feet wide and 20 feet high, and I guess it depends on your perspective, but I think these vines are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they're such a vibrant green, and for those of you not familiar with it, this should give you an idea of how massive it is. This whole structure is one single leaf. And this is what I mean by compound leaf, is that it's split into multiple smaller pieces. Um, this is a potential host plant for the Miami Blue. We don't really have those in this area, but you know, hopefully someday they'll be able to make a comeback. And it's also heavily utilized by leaf cutter bees. If you ever see a knicker bean in the wild and you look at the plant closely, you can see a lot of uh, half moon shapes cut out of the leaflets. And those are from leaf cutter bees uh, taking the pieces back to line their nests, which I always think is a pretty cool thing to see. These are one of the coolest things about the plants, which are the spines. They're recurved, so they point back towards the plant and that's actually the main way that the plant holds on to whatever it's trying to grow on. And the whole vine is completely covered in the, the stem, uh, the leaves, everything. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this is not a plant you wanna be walking into. It will grab onto your skin and your clothes and it is more than sharp and strong enough to tear both. And these are what the flowers look like. This is another type of pea flower. So there are two different uh, morphologies when it comes to the pea flowers. This looks a lot more like uh, what you would see on Royal Poinciana or um, the Hong Kong orchid trees, uh, just much, much smaller. Um, bees seem to go crazy for them. When the plant in the first picture was in full bloom, uh, there were dozens of species of bees and wasps and beetles and flies and butterflies and just all kinds of everything going all over the flowers. Uh, the fruit is kind of hard to make out as a legume because of how wide it is. Um, certainly not something you would be eating. But uh, the seeds are really cool because they're kind of like natural marbles. Um, it's, if you can gather enough of them together, they're really fun to handle. And I know uh, someone whose cat absolutely loves to play with them. So that's pretty cool too. Um, I've only seen this plant in the wild once, and that was in Big Cypress, just over the Broward County border in Collier. Uh, regardless, you can find seeds online, and the cool thing about this is that it produces edible beans and potato-like tubers. It's, uh, you know, really cool to me that it's a native plant that will give you uh, something that you can eat. Um, it fixes its own nitrogen, so it doesn't need nearly as much fertilizer as a normal potato plant. You're probably only gonna get about half the harvest you would get off of a normal potato plant, and it can take up to a year to get that. But the plant generally won't need nearly as much care, and again, it is a native plant, so it has, you know, it gets extra points for me in that regard. But I would certainly love to see people try and grow this more often, especially since potatoes are not the easiest thing to grow here. And from an edible native to a very much non-edible invasive 
Uh, this is actually one of the most poisonous plants in the world. <clears throat> and it's extremely difficult to find a natural area in Broward that does not have these to some extent. And I know I'm going just a little bit over on time, but I'm almost done. So uh, yeah, bear with me. Um, the plant is extremely poisonous to mammals, but I can't find a single report of someone dying from it in Florida. It seems to be much more of a problem for livestock. Um, just one tenth of a milligram would be enough to kill a person, but that's probably not going to happen because the seeds are hard as a rock. I don't know why anyone would even try and eat one, but it, it's certainly something to be mindful of. If you have any livestock or horses or anything like that, or you know anyone that does, this is definitely a plant that you want to watch out for. Um, and certainly you want to remove it as soon as possible and get every single seed you can find up. Um, normally I like to do a bit of a review, um, just the morning glories, the dog banes, philodendrons and climbing ferns. Those are all the vines that don't have tendrils. And then the passion flowers, the squashes, uh, smilax and grapes, those are the ones that do. Um, and again, it's important to remember how, how those tendrils come out. Passion flowers, it's always gonna be the leaf axle. Squashes, they come out at a 90 degree angle. For smilax, they have paired tendrils. And for grapes, the tendrils come out on the opposite side of the stem. Peas could be either, but pay attention to the fruit, the flowers, and whether you can determine if it has alternate compound leaves. Um, so there's one more vine that I want to go over, uh, and I'll try and do this really quickly because I know I'm going just a little bit over on time, and that's Devil's Claws. And this is my personal favorite vine, a uh, native vine, and not super common, but it is around, and I don't think I need to explain where it gets the name Devil's Claws from. Uh, this is basically like, you know, organic barbed wire, it's in the same family as Bougainvillea. Um, it is a liana, and it's one of the largest vines that I've seen this far south. Uh, if you're just looking at the plant normally, you can't necessarily tell how dangerous it is, but you can kind of see a slight resemblance to Bougainvillea. Um, and this is one of the things that makes it dangerous and why certainly I wouldn't recommend growing it in a home landscape, but if you're just going through a wooded area, if you got caught on this, you could have serious problems trying to get yourself out. This is what it looks like growing up into the tree, and you can see it just goes crazy as it starts to get older. Um, this particular individual was covering at, at least a thousand square feet of canopy, and it went out in each direction, you know, at least 30 feet from where the trunk was. It was, I, I can't even tell what plant it was growing on anymore. Um, here you can see it from the outside growing on a gumbo limbo. It was growing on a lot of different plants. Um, and again, not necessarily super distinct if you're just looking at it from a distance. Uh, it does have flowers and is really attractive to pollinators when it's blooming. But to me, the thing that stands out the most about this plant is the fruit. Um, and one of the other common names for this plant is the bird catcher plant. And I'm apologizing in advance if this picture is a little bit disturbing. Uh, this is not in Florida, but I couldn't find a great picture of the fruit of the one in Florida. So I'm using this as a stand in, but the fruit of Pisonia species, uh, when they're ripe, they exude this sticky tar like substance that'll stick to basically anything. So if a bird flies into it, especially a smaller bird, it'll get completely covered. And in the case of like a really small bird, like a hummingbird, there have been reports of them not even being able to leave the plant. Uh, certainly, again, not something I would recommend people try and grow in a home landscape. And you might be wondering, you know, what's wrong with me? How could I think this plant is cool in any way? So, um, you know, as gruesome as this might seem to us, this is a native plant. 
And absolutely, we need to practice putting the right plant in the right place. And home gardens and city parks probably aren't the right place for this vine or many other vines. And I couldn't blame anyone for wanting to remove them from their property, even if it's a native plant. But when it comes to natural areas, they belong here just as much as any other native plant. Yes, they may have negative impacts on the plants they grow on, or in this case, the wildlife that the fruit sticks to, but even that is potentially a vital role in the ecosystem. And uh, what we always need to remember is that dead trees are new opportunities for other life to flourish. So, you know, if you're looking at a vine and all you can see is how much damage it's doing, you're really only seeing half the story, if that. Um, so that is it. And thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed it and I will be more than happy to answer any questions. All right. So <clears throat> you can hear me, right? Yes. All yes. right. So this is Justin again. So we have a whole list of questions here. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you want to um, leave this up. You're absolutely welcome to do so. Or if you want to um, uh, not stop scary, sharing your screen, you can do that too. But um, I'd rather keep sharing it. Just I might need to go back to a slide to help answer a question. Perfect. So. All right. So uh, the first question is not related to, it's related to your presentation, but not to a plant that you specifically spoke about. Okay. Uh, but somebody is asking um, about the jade vine and asking mm -hmm. why it's so difficult to grow in our climate. Uh, apparently some people have issues growing it and some mm -hmm. do not. And if you would happen to know, since it's not a native, where something like that could be purchased. Uh, so as far as where to get it, um, the website that I had mentioned earlier, and it's, it's, the link is still on the screen, the Florida native nurseries.org probably wouldn't be able to tell you that there's another website called plant finder. You might be able to go there to find it. Um, other than that, I wouldn't have any specific recommendations. Uh, one of the things about plants in the pea vine, and I don't know how true this is for jade vine specifically, but, uh, they have symbiotic relationships with certain bacteria that allow them to sequester nitrogen out of the atmosphere. And they can't just do it with, you know, any bacteria that's laying around. They usually require specific ones that usually naturally occur in whatever area they're native to. So, I mean, some of them are certainly much more generalist than other ones. That's why some of them are invasive species. But without knowing anything else about the jade vine, I would say it's possible that it's difficult for it to form that relationship here for whatever reason. Um, but that being said, I do know people that have grown jade vines and have actually been able to get them to uh, fruit, which they almost never do here. So it, it will absolutely grow here under the right conditions. Um, having overly calcareous soil, which is very common in Broward, could also be a significant problem. So you may need to do significant amendments, adding things in like sphagnum moss, coconut coir, uh, pine fines, things like that. Those might be able to help you get it established. Um, but it's certainly not invasive and certainly not something that I wouldn't recommend for any reason. Again, I do know people that have grown them successfully, so I know it can be done. Sure, and, and not to take away from from your presentation, but I actually do grow it very, very successfully. It does, mm -hmm. it never fruited for me. That would be an absolutely amazing <laughs> thing. But what I figured, yeah. what I did figure out personally was that when I first got it, I was watering it with my city water and it was, it was growing, but not yeah. doing great. And as soon as I switched it to our well water, it exploded and did much better. Yeah. So I think maybe it might be sensitive to our chemicals. Um, that's I don't know. entirely, <laughs> but yeah, that's entirely possible. Um, you know, if you haven't measured the pH of whatever water you're using, uh, that could, that could certainly play a role. Or if you're using, you know, canal water or rainwater or well water, those could all potentially be having some effect on it. Sure. So definitely that's something to keep in mind. Um, 
but yeah, I, I, I couldn't get any more specific than that. Sure. And okay, so the next question, um, you kept mentioning, especially during the morning glory family part of mm -hmm. the conversation, that it would get weedy. And I think some people understand what that means, but could, mm -hmm. you, could you explain it a little bit more uh, for, for some people who might not have ever grown those? Yeah. So, I mean, when you get right down to it, a weed is just a plant growing where you don't want it to grow. And that could be a native plant or it could be an invasive plant. If it's growing where you don't want it to be growing, then it's a weed. So if you have a plant that's uh, predispositioned to be weedy, like most of the morning glories, um, when I'm saying that they're weedy, I mean, if you plant one, it's going to start sprouting up all over your yard. Um, even the case of the uh, sky blue cluster vine, which I absolutely love and would certainly recommend, the picture that I had of it growing on the tree, I got rid of that like six or seven years ago, and they still sprout up in that area occasionally. Yeah. Uh, so th that's definitely something to be mindful of. Uh, some of them are much worse about it than others. And, um, you know, it's not necessarily something that's going to take over all of your plants. They're not difficult to get rid of by any means, no matter how many of them sprout up. But some of them do also grow extremely quickly. So, you know, if you're not, if you let it go for a week, it could suddenly, you know, be five feet tall and, and starting to strangle one of your plants that you really like. So, sure. it, it, you know, it, they're, the morning glories specifically can be very difficult to control. Um, you know, wherever you plant it, it's not going to stay there. It's going to you know, start sprouting up in other areas. We've, so had that experience. We've had that experience with the purple passion vine. It, it got very large and started yeah. spreading very quickly. Very easy it, to control, but it did yeah. that exact thing. <laughs> and in the case of the purple passion vine, I, I did not mention this, but they will actually uh, form runners underground. So even if it's not reproducing, like by seed, uh, it'll you'll still have them sprouting up in various areas and I've also heard of people having problems with it because it kept sprouting up in their neighbor's yard and their neighbor didn't like that yeah uh, so again something to be mindful of we we measured the furthest away from the parent plant uh, a runner came up was about 22 feet yeah and that was actually quite surprising but again yeah you pluck it out of the ground and it's done. So it was, it was very yeah. natural. And I'm sure if it sprouts, you know, in the middle of the yard, you can just run it over with the lawnmower and, and it's done. Exactly. It's not, it's not that big of a problem, but it is something to be mindful of. Sure. The next question is uh, what, this says vines, but uh, uh, I'm going to hopefully let's keep it to native or, or mm -hmm. something that's not going to be invasive. Uh, but what vines would be best to attract birds and pollinators? What, like what would be maybe your top couple of vines that you would suggest if people want to have a butterfly garden? Hmm. So for birds, for hummingbirds specifically, anything with a red tubular flower um, one of the vines I did not mention was coral honeysuckle, which we have a native species of that, uh, but it's a more northern species, so it doesn't really occur this far south. You can grow it here, it just doesn't naturally occur. Um, and also the scarlet creeper. So those are two great vines for hummingbirds specifically. For birds in general, um, pretty much anything in the grape family is going to be your best bet. Uh, but... I have problems recommending them wholeheartedly to the average homeowner because they all get very large and, you know, they can be difficult to con uh, control to a certain extent. So uh, it, just for pollinators in general, the Morning Glory family is great. Uh, uh, you know, the Passion Vine family, certainly, you know, you're, you're going to get the four butterflies that I mentioned. Um, it, it really depends on what specifically you're trying to attract. If you're just trying to attract everything, I would say for just general purpose, plants in the morning glory family 
are, are going to be one of your best bets. Um, but other plants would have more specific uses, like try, sure. trying to attract, you know, zebra long wings or um, monarchs if you want to get the white twine vine. Sure. All righty. Um, how common is poison ivy in Southeast Florida? You mentioned it a little bit, mm -hmm. but some of us have never seen it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I have spent some time in other areas of the country, not as much as I'd like, but I can't say that poison ivy is really any less common here than it is anywhere else in the country. And that is to say it is among the most common vines that you will find. Um, at least in certain natural areas. Uh, I know in a lot of the exploring I've done in Big Cypress, it is all over the place. Um, they don't necessarily get as large here as they do in some of the northern states, but I know there's plenty of it in U. Taylor Birch. Um, I, I think basically every natural area I've been to, I, I've seen it to some extent. And it is extremely common. Um, it, again, I would have to say it is among the more common vines that you will find uh, in this area. All righty. Um, this is a, an add-on to the first question we asked, uh, and it's more of a repeat for you, so I, I'm really doing it for everyone else. <laughs> is, um, could you explain, give us the, the one-minute explanation of the Florida native nurseries.org. Uh, this is where you said people could find a lot of these yeah. plants. Yeah, so I mean, just to make it clear, I, I'm not necessarily endorsing them as a, a company or, or anything like that. Just it is a valuable resource if you are trying to find native plants of any kind, not just vines. You can go there and you can type in the name of the plant and it will give you a list of the nurseries in Florida that are known to carry that plant. Of course, you should still call the nursery to see if it has it, and it is by no means a complete list because the inventory, inventories of nurseries change all the time. But if you are looking for any native plant and you don't know where to start, you can go there. And at the very least, you can find nurseries that have a lot of native plants. And a lot of times, if you ask a nursery to get a plant, um, at the very least, it'll let them know that there is demand for that plant and they might end up getting it eventually or they might know somewhere else that you can get it. So, you know, never be afraid to ask. Great. Uh, next question, um, hopefully this will be pretty simple, but um, are there any good vines that you would suggest for growing on a home that aren't gonna actually destroy the foundation? Uh, a lot of vines will grow <laughs> into your walls and into yeah. your house. Are any of them less uh, obnoxious yeah. than others? Well, so the two things I would say about that is, first of all, I don't know of any vines that are really going to damage the house directly. Uh, some of them certainly will take the paint off, like the Virginia creeper and any of the um, philodendrons. If they start attaching to the wall, they can take the paint off. Mm -hmm. but they're not going to make it structurally unsound. Um, if you had a crack in the wall, hypothetically, it could send a root into there and make it worse. But other than that, they're not going to cause that much damage on their own. If you did want to actually grow a plant on your wall, the problem with that is how is it going to attach itself? Because the only ones that can really do that are things like the philodendrons, and Virginia creeper. And if you let it do that, again, it's gonna at least take the paint off. Sure. So um, that's a bit of a problem. I know one person who some of you may know, uh, Kristen Haas, she uh, teaches the Master Naturalist courses and she grew the railroad vine and she just grew it on the ground. And once it got long enough, she threw it up onto her roof. Um, so that is a potential option. The railroad vine, it will root at the nodes a bit, but since there's nothing for it to root into on the roof, that isn't really going to happen. It, it shouldn't cause any significant damage to anything. Okay. Um, it's not heavy enough um, to do anything like that. So, 
um, that, that would probably be the only vine I could really recommend for trying to do something like that. Um, okay. Unless you were going to put or, or attach a trellis or something to your wall and, and let the vine grow on that, which is certainly an option. Okay. And what recommendations would you have for vines that would grow in shade or part shade? If any. <laughs> uh, so that's a bit tricky. Um, some of the passion vines will tolerate shade quite a bit more than other vines. Um, but they're probably not going to flower and fruit nearly as much. Which, if you're only getting them for the butterflies anyway, it, you know, it, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Sure. But I've definitely seen them growing in full shade or nearly full shade anyway. Uh, the white twine vine, when I've seen it in the wild, a, a few of the areas I've seen it in have been pretty heavily shaded. So that could work, potentially. Okay. Um, the philodendrons are all adapted to grow in heavily shaded areas, but like I said, they're all invasive, so I can't recommend them. I, other than that, I, you know, it, it, it depends on how shady it is, uh, but most vines either aren't going to be able to grow in the shade all that well, or um, they're not going to bloom or fruit nearly as much as they would. Uh, if they were growing elsewhere. Okay. Great. So th I feel like this is a loaded question, <laughs> but um, ways to kill the potato vine. Yes. Yes. Um, and, so and, all right, to be clear, the air potato vine. Obviously. Yes. No, I, I, I definitely, that, but for everyone else, <laughs> I definitely know which one they were referring to. Um, so air potato, uh, so the official position of UF, which I agree with, as I had mentioned earlier, I've done a lot of invasive species removal. Um, if you use herbicides appropriately, uh, if you use them at the right ones, at the right time, in the right way, the right amount, on the right plant, there really shouldn't be a problem with using them. They, most of them are not nearly as dangerous as most people think they are. And a lot of the problems associated with them are the misuse or overuse of them. So uh, in terms of air potato, uh, glyphosate is one of the best ways to get rid of it. And I can understand why a lot of people would not want to do that. Um, it certainly is not your only option. Uh, if you can find an herbicide with triclopyr, which is often in like brush killer or poison ivy killer, you can uh, just use a few drops of that or even like use a paintbrush and paint it on the stem after you cut it. So you're, you know, you're barely using any of it. Sure. Um, and it'll still help. Uh, other than that, and even if you do do that, even if you, you know, go all out and use whatever herbicide you want to, chances are you're not going to kill it on the first time anyway, no matter what you do. Uh, you have to, the only surefire way is to dig up the, the tuber that's underground. And the problem with that is they can often have multiple tubers that are, you know, can be multiple feet away from each other and they can also be underground. Um, like I was saying earlier, if it has bulbs on it and there's one that's even the size of a pea that falls off and you can't find it, it's going to turn into another plant. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you do, uh, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of patience. And absolutely, you can just keep pulling them out, and it will die eventually, but it can take years um, and a lot of effort. So if you don't want to use herbicides, certainly follow the vine back to where it's going into the ground and dig up as much as you can. Um, but th th there really isn't much else you can do. Uh, the USDA did release the air potato beetle, which has been very successful in controlling it in natural areas, but uh, they are not currently taking orders for them. They're not going to do that until at least October and supplies are going to be limited, but you can contact the USDA and, and ask them if they can send you some of the air potato beetles to send out. That will not kill the plant, 
but it will help weaken it and help stop it from taking over. Got it. All right. Let me see. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, here's a great question. I think a lot of people asked, uh, what kind of vine would you recommend that won't often or will never have its leaves eaten by caterpillars or iguanas? Absolutely nothing. nothing. There's no such plant. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, Simple yeah. answer. <laughs> the, the closest thing you could get to that would be, or I, um, the philodendrons and plants in the dog vein family. So the problem with philodendrons is, again, they're all invasive, so I can't recommend them. And they do still get occasionally eaten by some things. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what off the top of my head. I, I don't know a specific animal that eats them, but there are some things that will. Uh, and as for the dog bane family, um, basically all of them are the host plant for something. In the case of the white twine vine, you've got the monarchs, the queens, and the soldiers, which I would hope most people wouldn't have a problem with them getting eaten. But those will generally be the only things that eat them and uh, not other caterpillars that you don't want or probably not the iguanas so much. In the case of things like the wild alamanda, and you know there are other plants in the family, um, those are or at least can be the host for the polka dot wasp moth and a few other related uh, moths and if for anyone that has an oleander this is the same orange caterpillar with the black hairs on it um, they eat a lot of plants that are in that family not really the milkweed so much but they will go after uh the vines in that family for the most part and you know that's going to be a personal perspective type thing because, you know, I think they're really cute. I think the moth they turn into is absolutely gorgeous and I always love seeing them. Uh, so I personally would not have any problem uh, with my plant getting devoured by them, assuming they don't eat enough to kill it. Sure. Uh, yeah, but just be aware that, you know, any plant that you get with the exception of invasive species, which you shouldn't be growing, is going to be attacked by something at some point. Okay, great. Uh, what uh, what can you tell us about um, asparagus fern, kind of the mm -hmm. 30, 30 second overview of <laughs> this awful, awful plant? Yeah, um, I mean, I think you just covered it. It's, it's an awful plant, please don't grow it. Um, there are, ornamental versions of it that seem to be okay. I don't see them going crazy. Uh, if you try and remove it, please be aware that it does have spines that are almost impossible to see, so be careful of that. And also it does have underground tubers, so you'll have to dig those up as well. But um, yeah, there's it, it, it's similar to the air potato vine in terms of there's no easy way to get rid of it, and you're probably not gonna get all of it on the first try. Um, so you've got to have patience and please don't plant it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then the last question we have right now, do you recommend the strangler fig? Okay. So strangler figs are not vines, but I have no problem talking about it. Uh, generally speaking, no, I wouldn't recommend planting any, uh, ficus tree in your yard. Uh, there is a vine ficus, which is ficus pumilla, and that I've seen on um, like the border walls they put around neighborhoods sometimes. That's actually, it, it looks like ivy, but it's actually a ficus. Um, and that's one of the few ficus that are truly vines. So for the strangler fig, first of all, that could refer to a lot of different plants, but for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to assume you mean the native golden fig which is Ficus aurea. Um, the problem with that is that it's just too big. Um, hypothetically, you could keep it in a pot for a while and try and bonsai it basically. Uh, but I mean, you're talking about a tree that when it's mature, it's going to be you know, up to 50 feet tall and have a canopy that could easily be 50 feet wide. Their roots, can go out at least that far away from the trunk, if not further. And, you know, they have 
the roots that are in the ground have a tendency to wrap around, you know, anything they can find. So if they find your uh, water pipes or, you know, any utilities that you have in the ground, they can wrap around that and uh, crush them or at least damage them. They can easily raise up the foundation. Um, you know, if you have a huge property, absolutely you could grow one, but I would think you would need at least several acres. I would never recommend having one within a hundred feet of anything you don't want it to damage. Um, it, you know, it is an excellent plant for wildlife. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's one, uh, I'm not sure if it'd be considered a keystone species necessarily, but it's one of, you know, the most prolific fruit producers and uh, even leaf litter producers in the natural areas it occurs in. And uh, so, you know, it, it's a great plant integral to many of the habitats that we have here. It's the host plant for the um, uh, ruddy dagger wing. Uh, you know, birds absolutely love the fruit and people can eat them as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's great for wildlife, but I could never recommend planting it in the yard. And, and this is really one of the main points that we at Extension try to make when we talk about Florida friendly landscaping and putting the right plant in the right place. Absolutely, a uh, strangler fig, if it's a native one, could be considered the right plant, but the average homeowner's yard is not the right place for it. Great, awesome. Um, did you have anything else to wrap up? Um, I'm, otherwise, I'm gonna move over to Carl. I, I mean, it just in closing, um, like I said, uh, this is my email address. You're certainly uh, welcome to use it anytime if you wanna ask me any questions about any plants or insects or anything like that. And please feel free to share that email address uh, with anyone. Um, I, I would just like to clarify one thing and that's there are many, many more vines than what I covered in here. Um, there's just, there's no way I could cover them all. Uh, so uh, really the, the main, if you take anything away it, it, from this, it's that um, you can learn what you're looking at and it, it's, you know, it's not that difficult. Um, it, I don't know. It, it's, I, I just like the idea of people being able to understand what they're looking at. And to me, it, it helps form a connection with the area around you. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Um, I'm going to move over to Carl now. All right. All right, Carl, you're good to go. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Justin. Adam, <clears throat> thank you so much for a uh, most informative presentation. Uh, you stated you could do this all night. I, I can see why. Uh, but again, in extremely uh, informative. A lot of questions were generated, and we're extremely appreciative. More so, we're appreciative that we were able to secure you this summer uh, and uh, knowing that you're going to be leaving the area in a, in a couple of months heading to Gainesville. And again, congratulations on uh, receiving your internship for your doctoral program. And hopefully when you come back as um, uh, Dr. Pitcher, we would like to have you back. Thank you, sir. And with that, um, I would also like to, for next month, uh, inform you that <clears throat> as Van had mentioned, we have um, Rich Ackerman from the Fort Lauderdale Orchid Society that we're presenting uh, about the Million Orchid Project. So a lot of uh, information is gonna be forthcoming on that. You've uh, also seen a little bit of a flavor from our newsletter this month that Van had mentioned about it lightly. And again, so we look forward to next month. And with that, I will turn this over to Van. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, am I on here? Yes. Uh, you are. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. It went on. Those, I was amazed to mention some of those lines you get, and uh, especially the, uh, the morning glory. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm going to close it off because we've had a long meeting, and I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. One thing before we leave, I would like to go and extend my congratulations to Gary Pataka and the, uh, the group that did the uh, Green Initiative. 
the cities of Fort, well, I'm sorry, the cities of Oakland Park and Wilton Manors have formally signed the, uh, the agreement to stop using pesticides in some of their parks. They're going to go into a project now to see how they can bring these parks back to their natural state. And uh, we, the Garden Club has been very instrumental, especially Gary, in, in promoting this. And uh, I really am very proud of our club for having supported uh, such an environmentally initiative. Um, that will also be in the next, uh, in the, the next newsletter. Uh, I'm going to uh, close off now. I think that we should all go home and, uh, or we are at home, and um, just enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much for attending. Good night.